Hello there together learners, Eric back again, your learning futurist. When thinking about esports and the design of video games, there's one game that comes to mind as one of the first most important games in both design, development, and in the development of competitive electronic gaming, and that is Space War. <laughs> and in this video, we're going to talk about Space War, how it was developed, why it was developed, and why this game is so important to why and how we play esports today and how it's become so popular. So many decisions, so important to what we have today around esports and game design. So Space War, let's go. All right, Space War. Well, it's, <laughs> um, it's been redone, remade so many times. You've seen games like Asteroids and other games. This is one of the first games ever made. Um, it's still debatable whether it was the first or not. Um, it wasn't even, I don't think, designed as a game first off. It was dur made during the space race, and there were talks about trying to develop simulators so uh, potential astronauts can understand things like the pull of gravity and how you might maneuver a spacecraft. But in all actuality, it was a game that was developed for the PDP-1 by DEC. It's a company that made these huge um, kind of computers that were only really accessible to large companies and large universities is where this game was made. And one of the beautiful things about esports, and I hope to come uh, to talk about this throughout the video as a theme, is how esports can be so beneficial in higher education institutions because it links scholarship, curiosity, tinkering, and with the competitiveness and gameplay of ver uh, video games. And we see this through this uh, first iteration of a competitive electronic game sport, right? So uh, the Digital Equipment Corporation made the PDP-1, PDP the uh, Digital Processor 1. It's a huge computer. It looks a little bit like this. This is actually a shot that's from a museum. It's on display. I don't know if any of these are working still today, but it didn't even have a CRT monitor. We've already uh, gone past several iterations of displays, but this was a vector display, much the way the technology that a oscilloscope might use back in the day that would show frequencies on a, on a screen. This whole setup that took up half of a room it only had like 100 kilobit, kilobytes of memory and a very slow processing power. And of course, this, the output screen was the, only this little circular uh, vector display that you see behind me as well. You input either through a typewriter or it had some, I think it had a card reader for a punch out card reader as well. So students at MIT where one of these first PCs were bought uh, in today dollars would be about $1.5 million to get your hands on one of these PCs got put into the hands of students at uh, the Michigan, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology and they started to develop software and things. And one of the ideas was, well, the space race is happening. This is in the early 1960s. Let's see if we can help train astronauts or do some sort of simulation using this software. And one person that came up with that idea was encouraged to try and make something on their own. And that's how we got Space War, which looks a lot like this. Here we have... A demonstration of it way back in the day. And you can see some of these um, controllers that were created for this. We see again today, even the professional, um, there are only, it's a box with buttons on it, right? Just buttons. And these same style buttons, they look so similar to what the pro fighting game people use today. Instead of a stick, they just have a big box with buttons on it. And it's very interesting that we still have this today. Another interesting thing talking about scholarship and gaming kind of merging together is 
Of course, this piece of software became available and then it started to proliferate to the other universities that were collaborating and also had access to these machines. And so very quickly, this became one of the students, you know, kind of onboarding activities to load in some software, to grab the software from another university that perhaps was using it and have the students hop on and actually play a game just to see the operational function of this computer, this huge computer. You had to load it in by, I think, one of these big tapes or tape, tape reels uh, back in the day, which is very much like my own personal journey into PCs before even hard drives were a thing and I was using something called an 8086 to boot up on a floppy drive and figure out how to use DOS commands and prompts to run my PC, to run simple games. That gaming aspect was a vector to get into other things like programming and uh, computer science and other things around computer hardware as well. And that's why I think even for these students, uh, playing games was a vector for them to go on and do great things in the computer uh, industry, software industry, and the booming dot-com that came many years later. All right, so... Uh, the game itself was pretty simple, but after it started to proliferate through the rest of these universities around North America, mostly the United States, uh, namely Stanford, after 10 years in 1972, decided to have a formal competition based on this game. So this is what we're seeing now is the actual article that was written about this competition that was published in Rolling Stone magazine in 1972. So after 10 years of this being kind of proliferated and shared at the universities that had this large machine, they actually had a competition and people got together, students got together to actually compete using this game. And this also tells us that competition is a normal human thing as well. We game, we game together, we have some friendly competition. And even before we had home consoles like the Nintendo, Famicom, and the Atari, or other things that were allowed, uh, that got gaming systems into homes. Even before then, uh, people were using uh, PCs and games and to kind of gather, get together, have some fun, and have some competitive spirit. And this goes to show how much esports has evolved, and even when it wasn't really available to a lot of people, um, students, faculty, people around these machines got together to compete and have some fun playing these games against each other. And here we are, uh, this pr lucky person, um, Bruce, is unofficially, and somewhat officially in most circles, is named the first esports champion of all time at this tournament in 1972 at Stanford where they had this PC set up back in the day. Right, beautiful kind of idea. We see this start to happen throughout the kind of uh, evolution of esports online. And we can kind of say that Space War was kind of one of the first to set up, to kick off this idea that uh, video games can be competitive, they can bring people together, you can have events and things around them and they could be worthwhile. I'm hoping to have a series of other videos based on this idea, walking through some of these other pivotal points in esports history with the idea of scholarship, uh, study, and gameplay, game design, and other things wrapped together, and what we've learned through the evolution of this process through esports and game design. But Space War was really one of the first pivotal moments in this evolution. It's a very simple game. Uh, this might look familiar to you. There's games based on this type, very basic game design as well. You have two players uh, and a star in the center, which has a large gravity pull. And one of these uh, ships, these rockets, was called the wedge, and the other one was, was called the needle. So you can kind of different, each player can differentiate with each other and in the middle was a star and the star had gravity and it pulled you towards it. Very simple setup and actually uh, from what I read 
They had dots on the screen that represented the stars, and I even spent some time putting the stars in the correct spots so it would actually resemble what you might see as stars if you were up in orbit. Very interesting. So the controls are very simple, right? You can hit the thrust. I think early versions or subsequent versions had only a set amount of fuel that you could use to thrust to either escape the gravity of the sun or to move and maneuver out of the way of your competitor. You can rotate your rocket right and left and you can fire torpedoes and you had a hyperspace jump, which is like a, a, um, a weapon of last resort. <laughs> it's where you could hit the button and pop back at a random place on the screen. And sometimes that could be in the middle of the star and you're dead or in the, in the flight, right in the flight path of a oncoming torpedo and you would die anyway. So all of these very simple controls led to some interesting, fast, very good gameplay. And through our experiments, here at the Kyoto University of Foreign Studies, we found that this actually, this design uh, is unmistakably a good design for uh, beginner esports tournaments, uh, to both put on esports tournaments and to compete in them for a bunch of reasons. The basic gameplay is um, you start off in different corners of the screen, you shoot at each other, you avoid hitting the star, and the last ship standing is the winner. And early versions of this didn't even have a score display. You just basically had to know when the other ship exploded because the game didn't have enough memory or other things in its, uh, its program to actually keep count of who died first or who has the most score, uh, etc. So there was no UI. There was no UX, really, uh, that displayed uh, things that were happening in the game. So... When we did this, uh, I'll tell you, talk about this in just a second, we actually had to have a bit of a referee to help the players uh, fairly decide winners when we did this here at the Kyoto University of Foreign Studies. But again, this machine, very expensive machine, this idea that people used games, it was one of the first things to help get students interested, onboarded, and starting to use these very complicated machines back in the day, and it was a vector. And we're starting, I use this personally in my classes as well, right? We introduce a game. Uh, if it's simple to program, it's simple to maybe put on, you can use maybe HTML, CSS, JavaScript, you can recreate it. And also for, for example, tourism and marketing students to be able to put on an event, a competitive event, get people registered, and come up with a champion at the end is a very good model and practice a fun way to get people and using games to practice real world skills. And we saw this throughout this theme that's happening around esports and the scholar esports. So here we are at the Future Hub here at Kyoto University of Foreign Studies, where we've been working hard to, to develop a new kind of interactive space where we're very much interested in the latest in technology, like augmented and virtual reality, but this day we decided to recreate with students the first ever esports event. And we have this place called the U Theater. It's 180 degree, five foot, I'm sorry, five meter uh, diameter screen, immersive screen, where we can have uh, different types of events, show off uh, virtual tours and do simulations, but today we were using it to have our competition. We had a couple screens off to the side where students can sign up and practice the game itself. I gave a couple of little short, quick lectures about the history of the game, and students were off playing it. And we found that this is a great game for a beginner tournament because rounds were simple, short, easy, right? You can, this is a game that has simple controls, and you can start even without playing this game ever before, you can hop in and play it. And one round playing with another player lasted 30 seconds to a minute. So it's very good for a beginning tournament for our students to both um, compete in, participate in, and also to organize a round. So we're going to try and continue this series. Um, if we do, the next big pivotal 
thing in esports and the history of esports and competitive play is Space Invaders with the, uh, the advent of the Atari 2600. And it was the first international uh, kind of uh, tournament that had people competing in multiple countries all around the world. So that was your introduction to the history of esports through the game called Space War. I hope this was interesting to you. And if you're wanting to know more about esports and how to use it as your vector to get interested in things like programming, computer science, and computer citizenship, etc., please come on down to TL Learning and learn some more. We'll see you in the next one, guys. Bye-bye.